again. Today I want to use smoke detectors, the things that we've got on the ceilings in our houses, and use them to see what we can learn about radioactive materials and radiation. Well, I guess the first thing we should do is um, produce a diagram of a smoke detector and have a look at how it might uh, how it might work. So essentially, it's a circuit uh, with a gap in it, and the gap is um, what contains basically the air in our houses. So the rest of this circuit, and this is a very simplified view, you'll understand, um, looks something like that. Uh, there's something that measures a current flowing and then somewhere down here uh, there's our um, our battery All right and this is our standard symbol for a battery and usually at least the ones in my house these um, tend to be nine volt uh, batteries and there's no needle on a dial or anything to look at uh, this is uh, basically a piece of a uh, piece of clever circuitry now, as it's set up, there can't possibly be uh, any current flowing in this device. Okay, so this is this is the clever bit. So within here, right, we've just got the air of our house. It's the air near the ceiling, usually, um, and they're placed on ceilings, of course, because if there is a fire, then the hot air, including the smoke within it, will tend to rise. Uh, so putting these things on a ceiling is actually a pretty good idea. But what we're going to need out here is something that we can shine into this gap um, to create ions. So in other words, we want to have um, oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air that have had one or more electrons taken off them. So we'll have these uh, electrons in here, negatively charged electrons. Um, and we'll have the rest of the oxygen or nitrogen, which will be left positive. And because of the way this battery is, is set up, these positives will tend to go to the negative charged plate. And the electrons will tend to go to the positively charged plate. And in that way, they're actually completing the circuit uh, and um, producing a current. All right, so the current is bridging that gap simply because we've got electrons and positively charged ionized oxygen and um, uh, nitrogen atoms moving uh, between these electrodes. All right, so moving between the positive electrode and the negative electrode, right? Negatives attracted to positive, positives attracted to the negative. So that brings us to this little thing here. And this actually is our source of radiation. And what that radiation does is produce these very ions that we need, the electrons and the positive ions, uh, in order to complete our circuit. OK, so in normal operation, this radioactive source is ionising the air in this gap here. This essentially then is an ionisation chamber. And that's producing a small but measurable current uh, in the circuitry of our box. Right, fine as far as it goes. But then, of course, along comes the smoke. from our fire and it'll enter this chamber here and actually prevent these ions from completing the circuit. So of course the result of that uh, is that the current measured by our circuit drops and it's that dropping of the current, the falling of the current, that then uh, produces 
from some loudspeaker or other, let's just draw our loudspeaker on the side, that then produces uh, the alarm signal that tells us that something is amiss. So we need to talk about this. We need to talk about our source uh, of radiation, which is coming from um, a radioactive material. And it's a rather particular one. And it's actually a rather esoteric one. And that's really what I want to focus on uh, um, in the next section. Okay, so I've sketched out our smoke detector again. All right, principal components, something to measure a current, an ammeter, a battery, uh, an ionization chamber, which is open to the air, uh, and a radioactive source, which kicks a few electrons off our oxygen and nitrogen air molecules. They drift towards the positive electrode in our ionization chamber, and the positively charged ions, the leftover bits, as it were, um, travel towards the negative. And all the while that current is flowing, all the while the circuit, in other words, is completed, our circuitry that's measuring the current is happy and our alarm is switched off. It's only when smoke gets into here that this process is disrupted, the current measured drops, the alarm goes off. Alright, so it's this bit that I want to focus on now. And the key ingredient within our source of ionising radiation uh, is an element called americium. And it has the chemical symbol AM. Now, it's in there in tiny quantities. That's all that's needed to produce this effect. But this is a rather interesting element. Uh, it's number 95 in the periodic table, um, which is a number higher than uranium. Uranium is at 92. This is not, therefore, a naturally occurring element. Um, so americium is actually made as a byproduct in nuclear reactors. Uh, and it was first identified as a new element in 1944. So it's been around um, in our, through our lifetimes, essentially. Um, and the specific form of americium used in this radioactive source uh, is something called um, americium-241. It's the particular isotope of americium. Uh, and you'll see that uh, in um, those of you who are into proper nomenclature, uh, this will be written as a superscript to americium and the 95, its place in the periodic table would appear down there as a subscript. All right, so this is our special radioactive material, man-made radioactive material, uh, that is actually driving uh, our smoke detector. Now, americium-241 uh, has a half-life, so that's the time it takes for half of these radioactive uh, isotopes to decay. It has a half-life of about uh, 432 years. It's actually 432.2 uh, years. So actually this lasts a long time. Uh, what's going to bring your smoke detector to the end of its life is not the radioactive source. It'll be other bits and pieces that uh, fail in there uh, way before uh, you have a problem uh, with your radioactive source. So let's have a look at um, our americium uh, as it appears in our smoke detector in a slightly more detail. So this is a particular isotope, remember, americium-241. 
Now, I told you there wasn't very much in your smoke detector, and in fact there's, um, there's really nothing in there at all uh, in terms of measurable amounts or anything measurable on scales that we've got. Uh, and it ap appears in there uh, as an oxide, it's actually americium dioxide. And about one gram of this uh, is enough to produce in the region of 5,000 smoke detectors. So you can see that within a, any one smoke detector there is a very tiny amount uh, of americium itself. But even with that tiny amount, what we're getting is enough ionising radiation to make sure that uh, the oxygen and nitrogen within our ionization chamber is ionized enough to complete the circuit I showed you earlier uh, for our smoke detector. And in fact, when I say it's producing enough, what it's actually giving us is something in the region of 35,000 radioactive decay events per second and the units for this are named after Henri Becquerel so we have 35,000 radioactive events per second going on in this tiny amount of americium in our smoke detector and this level is high enough to ionize enough of the air in the ionization chamber to complete that circuit and to make sure that the alarm is off until of course smoke gets in and disrupts the process. So this actually sounds quite a lot. Uh, it's worth I think dwelling uh, on this radioactive decay process in a little bit more detail. So let's sketch that out. Okay, so this is the formal radioactive process that's going on. Let me talk you through it. So here's our americium. Remember it had, it has the 95th place in the periodic table. The particular form we're looking at is 241. That's the isotope that we're interested in. And it decays, and it decays, remember, with a half-life uh, of um, 432.2 years so this stuff hangs around for a long time uh, and it decays actually into another artificial element another man-made element called neptunium so this is neptunium it's one higher than uranium in the periodic table and uranium uh, is um, the highest place of the naturally occurring elements. So again, this is not regarded as a naturally occurring element. We have made it. Um, and actually Neptunium itself decays through all sorts of different processes and it'll end up being either bismuth um, Or thallium. Right, both of which are stable, non-radioactive. So that's that's its end point, but that's a long way away. Uh, we're talking about many, many years uh, before we start seeing measurable amounts of those being formed. But in decaying from this form of americium to neptunium, uh, we've also got given off um, alpha radiation, right? which has this symbol here. Uh, and also small amounts of gamma radiation. Now I stress this is quite a small amount. It's this one that actually is doing all the work in terms of ionizing the oxygen and nitrogen in our um, ionization chamber in the smoke detector and alpha radiation is um, what renders these devices actually really very safe 
because alpha radiation is stopped. It's stopped in its tracks by just a few centimetres of air and certainly the plastic that surrounds your um, smoke detector is more than enough to prevent any alpha radiation leaking outside. And in fact the, uh, the dead skin cells that form the epidermis uh, on your body are again more than adequate uh, to stop alpha particles uh, affecting your body. The exception to this of course uh, is that if you ground this americium into a powder and breathed it in this would then do a lot of damage in your lungs. So you don't ingest the contents of your smoke detector is essentially what I'm saying. I'm hoping that's not a serious risk. Actually it's also the reason why you're always warned when you buy a smoke detector not to dispose of them by burning them. Because of course by burning them you're really going to release this americium into the atmosphere. Uh, this little bit of gamma radiation is enough to leak out but it's in such tiny quantities that the background radiation around us day in day out uh, swamps any effect that this uh, small amount of uh, radiation might uh, might present us. Um, and I think the thing to um, to stress in all of this uh, is that um, our smoke detector saves lives. So there is a minuscule risk associated with this material and what comes out of it more than outweighed by the number of lives uh, that have been and will be saved by having them in your house. Uh, life is about balancing risk. That's inevitable. Uh, this is actually a pretty good balance. Uh, so we ought to have a look inside a smoke detector. Uh, I've got an old one that I used for this purpose. This is not an experiment I would recommend you doing at home. So here then is our smoke detector in all its glory. Um, this is the back of the case. This is the face that grew up against, uh, against the ceiling. And here's the circuitry inside uh, that I told you about in terms of measuring uh, measuring the current. Uh, this is the ionization chamber, this black cylinder that you can see mounted here. So there we are, um, the Commonwealth Garden smoke detector uh, and um, using it to illustrate a little bit about radioactive materials and um, radiation in general and to hopefully demonstrate to you that not all radiation is bad. Uh, in this case, radiation saves lives. So, until next time, bye.